after a sleeping driver ran us off the road, his insurance company wrote off as a total loss our boat, motor, and trailer. We needed a bigger boat anyway. We couldn't afford to buy one, but maybe I could build one suitable for salt water. The older I get, the faster the years go by. Childhood passed slowly. The middle years flowed swiftly. And then, all of a sudden, here I am. I searched for plans on the internet and found SpiraInternational.com. Jeff Spira's designs can be built with common plywood and lumber, using common tools and deck screws. Strength comes from fiberglass over the plywood outside and epoxy over everything inside. I'd never done fiberglass. I'd find out how with YouTube. I built a small sailing dinghy for my grandsons years ago, but I had no experience building larger boats. I decided to build two, a drift boat to learn on, so I'd not make mistakes on the boat I'd be taking out on the ocean. I began building the dory on April Fool's Day. For the first boat, I plotted the frames directly on the basement floor with a felt pen. The broad tip did not lend itself to precise measurements. For the dory, I drew the frames on a sheet of plywood with a sharp pencil. The next day, the first day of building, I built all seven frames, the transom frame, and cut out the stem. I countersunk screws and drilled pilot holes so the screws would draw up tight. I used PL Premium 3X construction glue. I cut the transom to the correct height for our 20-horse short shaft Honda outboard motor. To make cutouts in the bottoms of the frames to accommodate the keelson, I drilled two half-inch holes in each frame centered an inch and a quarter above the bottom and three inches either side of center. I set my table saw blade up an inch and a half, made many cuts through each frame between the holes, and knocked out chips with a mallet and chisel. The slots are half an inch wider than the keelson on each side, limber holes to allow bilge water to flow all the way to drains in the stern. I mixed a small batch of epoxy and brushed it into areas that would be hard to reach later. That was as far as I could go before building the strongback, the stand on which the boat would be built. I gathered enough small scrap pieces of 2x6, 2x8, and 2x10 to make the frame blocks. It was almost cocktail hour by the time the strongback was finished, but I took the frames out of the basement and set them in place to see how it looked. I measured and marked frame locations and fastened each frame to the strong back with one screw. After making sure all frames were square with the strong back and with each other, I put a second screw into each frame. When I clamped the transom into position, something didn't look right. There wasn't enough flare in frame one, the frame nearest the transom. Instead of a smooth, continuous convex shear from stem to stern, the shear would be concave between the transom and frame two. I assumed I'd screwed up. I checked measurements of frame one against the plan and against my lofting board. Either the plan was in error, not likely, or the shear was supposed to curve in and back out. I didn't like the way it would look. Rather than build a new frame, I ripped two wedges from a scrap of 2x2 two two the length of the frame's side members. The wedges tapered from a point at the bottom to one inch wide at the top. I glued them to the outside of the frame. To my eye, that looked better. I ripped corresponding wedges off the insides of the frame. I used a rasp to bevel the notches in the forward frames to match the angle of the upsweeping keelson. I checked frames for square to center line and tacked on long strips of thin plywood to hold them all in position while I glued and screwed the keelson to them. The plan calls for a 2x6 for the keelson. The drift boat called for a 2x4, but I could not get a 2x4 to bend far enough to the required curve. Instead, I fastened a 1x4 to the frames, and then glued and screwed another 1x4 on top of it. That was easy and it worked just fine, so I didn't even consider using the called for 2 inch plank for the Doris Keelson. I used two pine 1x6s 
There is a rule about building boats. You can't have too many clamps. I began the second week by removing clamps and shaving extruded glue with a sharp chisel. The last task of the day was to scarf two sets of three eight-foot one-by-fours to get the length for the chine logs. When screwing frames together, I didn't think to allow room for subsequent cutouts for the chine log. That slowed my day and cost me a circular saw blade. After I hit the first screw, I looked at all the rest of them and removed a few and repositioned them. Then, starting at the transom, I clamped each chine log into position. I considered drilling pilot holes, but the first ones went in smoothly, so I didn't bother. But, on what was to be the very last screw, I didn't release the trigger in time. It's good that I don't have close neighbors. Profanity was intense and sustained. I pulled the split apart far enough to squirt in glue and clamped the wound shut. I found a couple of long, thin screws and carefully finished the job. I left clamps on overnight. To cut notches for the shear clamps, I set cut depth to three-quarter inch on the circular saw and made half a dozen cuts in each frame and tapped out the wood with mallet and chisel. Remembering the split chine log, I drilled pilot holes and countersank them. After applying PL Premium 3X to the stem, I clamped both sides simultaneously to keep the stem straight and carefully drove in screws. Except for final fairing with plane and belt sander, the frame was finished. After fairing the transom, I realized the keelson was not flush with the bottom. When framing the transom in the basement, I'd made sure the center bottom gusset was far enough from the edge to allow room for the keelson to butt against the transom, but I did not try to position the gusset precisely in line with the top of the keelson. When I screwed and glued keelson and transom together, the keelson had slipped and was resting against the gusset. I added tapered shims. Space-filling PL Premium Glue would allow bottom plywood to attach solidly and without voids. When I measured the shear clamps on both sides from transom corners to the point of the bow, there was only one-eighth inch difference. I spent time with paper, pencil, and calculator, figuring out how to cut three sheets of plywood to cover both sides of the dory. I cut three 25-inch pieces out of each of two sheets of 3 8 inch marine plywood and clamped them in place beginning at the stern. The first butt joint is centered on frame two. All other joints fall between frames. The next day I worked on fairing chines, frames, and keelson for half-inch bottom plywood. The keelson took a slightly different curve from the chines in the bend toward the bow, so I had to plane and sand the keelson between frames. It was back to the drawing board to figure out the best way to cut three sheets of plywood for the bottom in such a way as to get maximum structural strength with the fewest pieces. I wanted all butt joints on the frames. What I settled on was one sheet across the transom butting on frame two with about seven inches of overhang to be trimmed at the stern. I did the same with another sheet between frames four and six. The three feet cut off the ends of those two pieces but on the keelson in the space between frames two and four. The remaining forward section uses less than half of the third sheet. After measuring extreme width and height of the transom, I cut a rectangle from a piece of three-quarter inch marine plywood and clamped it to the transom frame to mark cuts for sides and motor cutout. After countersinking pilot holes in the thick plywood, I squeezed PL Premium 3X onto the transom frame and spread it evenly with a squeegee before clamping the plywood in place and driving screws. All plywood was on the boat. I fared the stem, transom, and chines with the plane and with 40 grit paper on the belt sander. I mixed epoxy, added lots of wood flour I'd been saving from the sander, and applied it with a narrow spatula to all screw heads, gaps and butt joints, and defects in plywood. I'd ordered 12 linear yards of 60-inch, 6-ounce fiberglass cloth to cover the transom, bottom, and bow with enough extra for 6-inch strips to reinforce side butt joints and transom corners. I'd used marine plywood for the sides so I wouldn't have to put fiberglass over them. I laid cloth out, smoothed it, and taped it in place. I cut a straight line from the front down the center, the scissor cut following the weave to the point where stem meets bottom. Then I wrapped each half of the cloth around the bow. 
I marked the perimeter of the cloth with pencil on the plywood so I could lay it back in the same position. Then I rolled out the second layer and cut it identically to the first. Starting at the bow, I rolled the second layer of cloth back onto the roller it was shipped on and set it aside. I rolled the first layer up on the box it came in, but not all the way. After spreading epoxy ahead of the cloth, I unrolled it in nearly perfect position. It required only slight pulls here and there to line up the cuts for transom corners and stem. The rest of the evening was hard work. I called it quits at 8 o'clock with the job unfinished. I ran out of epoxy before completing coverage of the second side of the boat. I called England Marine to be sure they had West System 105B epoxy resin and 205B hardener in stock before we drove the 50 miles to Newport to buy it. I got two of each. When we got home, I mixed enough epoxy to finish covering the side of the boat. My respirator got a workout. With an orbital sander and 150 grit paper, I went quickly over the entire boat, just hitting the high points enough that I could see where more aggressive sanding was needed. I ran the sander till the drive belt wore out. Then I switched to the orbital sander. By dark, I'd almost finished the entire boat, but I needed more belts and sandpaper for the transom. When the entire hull was no longer shiny, but scuffed to hold on to paint, I rolled on a coat of safety yellow. Paint wasn't fully cured, so I spent the morning working on a boat trailer I'd found on Craigslist for $100. I rolled on the second coat of paint and spent the rest of the day getting the trailer ready for the boat. I did not want to dismantle the strongback in case I ever wanted to build another dory. That meant I had to raise the boat high enough to slide the strongback out all in one piece. After removing all fasteners connecting the boat to the strongback, I used a long 4x4 as a lever, and, inches at a time, I raised the boat high enough to drag the strong back out from under it. I tied two ropes high on posts on both sides of the boat to cradle it, and then unclamped support planks from shed posts. I clamped a 2x6 to the boat ahead of the support rope to prevent the rope from slipping out from under the bow as I rolled the boat over. I tied a taut rope between posts above the boat ahead of the support rope to help keep the support rope from slipping under the bow. Once that rig was in place, it was a matter of turning on the GoPro and sliding the boat sideways a few inches at a time on both ropes. I wasted a lot of time trying to make a video record of building the drift boat. This is the only video I have of building this one. I wanted a record in case of disaster. A 2x4 held the boat in position near the balance point while I walked around to the other side and pulled the boat over. That's as far as it went. I continued working the boat along the support ropes until it was level. Yeah. 
Maybe they could you. <laughs> oh, and you're one person you have to use your brain. This is essentially how you do this. But this one weighs much more. That seemed like a good stopping place. We'll have part two next week. Maybe something different between now and then. Thanks for watching.